my name is Jane Dawson, and I'm here representing Quakers in Britain. And I first of all want to apologise to Sean, wherever he is, for not getting a biography to him. But I think it's very apt, because actually, I could be one of any Quaker speaking about this. In fact, I can see many around this room who could probably speak better than I can about this subject. But it has fallen to me, and my role for Quakers in Britain is actually uh, the role of the Advocacy and Public Relations Lead. And my team were given the job of retelling untold or hidden stories of World War I conscientious objectors. So some of you were here a couple of weeks ago to the event <coughs> we held. Um, and for me, it's been a, a life-changing experience. I discovered in my family stories about World War I conscientious objectors one of whom was imprisoned in Richmond Castle in solitary confinement, sentenced to death. I did not know the connection with my family. Quakers are in it for the long haul. I am only part of a long continuum of Quakers talking about peace, working for conscientious objection. Quakers have long opposed the conscription of citizens to fight in wars, but also the conscription of our taxes to pay for them. Why? Quakers believe there's something of God in every single one of us, and throughout our 360 degree, 360 degree, I've been talking too much, <laughs> 360 years of history, we've opposed all forms of killing or fighting. But we also believe in individual conscience, for the right of individuals to make a moral or a religious choice for which we may not agree. Today it's the White Feather Action Day. Some of you will see around the room little bookmarks with a white feather on. We're remembering the day that the Conscription Act was brought into force hundred years ago. Liz was talking about the power of stories. We know that the stories of conscientious objectors have not been told. They've been written out of history. We know that the tribunal records of many conscientious objectors have been ditched. It may not be a conspiracy, but they have been. We can't find a lot of the tribunal records. It's very interesting. I think it's my role the role of my team, the role of Quakers, the role of all of us, to retell the stories we have and to make sure that people know just what went on in the First World War. So a hundred years ago, I just want to tell you a little bit about what was going on in, for Quakers in Britain. It wasn't easy. It's never easy to make these choices. The Quakers were divided about what they should do. Some Quakers thought the war in 1914 would be over very quickly. Some decided to set up the Friends Ambulance Unit, going out to tend the wounded on the front line in France. Some set up the War Victims Relief Committee, helping those displaced by fighting. <coughs> it's been very interesting in getting involved with all this history to learn all the acronyms. I've got to remember to spell them out for you. So another acronym, FSC, the Friends Service uh, Committee. That was set up to advise young men of enlistment age. <coughs> and many Quakers fought, chose to join the military. They thought that by fighting they would bring the war to an end more quickly. A hundred years ago, Quakers were divided. It's worth remembering that this is not an easy journey. But by 1915, Quakers were united against the war. And we were the only church to actually speak out against it. And why were, we, why were we united a hundred years ago at that point? Why didn't we make a statement to the world? 
Well, the reason we did, it was because of the threat of conscription. We were agreed that the state could not compel people to fight. It was about the, the compulsion element. Throughout 1915, as we all know, <coughs> British casualties rose and rose to over 500,000. Asquith's government was in disarray. Coalition was formed. And under pressure to introduce conscription from all sides, Asquith was not sure himself what to do, but he was under pressure and he brought in various types of conscription. Some of you have heard of the, the Derby scheme. I don't want to go into those details yet, there's plenty of information, and I'm sure there's some on the side there. But it was a bit of a botched way of bringing in conscription. So there's several attempts to bring in an unsatisfactory and very opposed bill. So in the Christmas of, 2000, in the Christmas of 1915, Asquith and his government drafted the Military Service Act. The same Christmas, there were two MPs who were very busy also drafting part of that. And they were two Quaker MPs. And they decided to draft an extra exemption to the Military Service Act. Already in existence, there were exemptions for vital work for people who are involved in um, uh, nursing and so on. But the two Quaker MPs introduced and drafted an exemption on conscience grounds to combatant service. Straight after Christmas, they went to visit Asquith. Arnold Roundtree and Edmund Harvey, the two Quaker MPs, they met with Asquith on the 28th of December and they persuaded him to include the conscience cause. There was a great deal of dissent. The then MP for Brentford called it a Shirkers Charter. And I'm just delighted, <laughs> delighted that we now have the uh, MP for Brentford and I have taken the opposite view. <laughs> <laughs> On the 27th of January, the bill was introduced. By the 2nd of March, it was the day for implementation. In that five week period, six, over 16,000 men had applied for exemption to fight, not to fight on the grounds of conscience. So we're talking about 5,000 people now, thinking about diverting their taxes. 100 years ago, there were 16,000 men only. However, the hastily drafted bill and the exemption clause created months of confusion and chaos. And we know that the experiences of many of those who applied for exemption were very poor. Many of them were vilified, ostracised, they were treated and bullied by the tribunals. Again, I don't want to go into a great deal of detail about them, but those stories need to be told. And for those of you with a bookmark, please do read the White Feather Diaries, which tells the stories of five of those conscientious objectors, some of whom actually received exemption and some who didn't, and some who were imprisoned and some indeed who face the death sentence. So those claiming conscientious objection were badly treated. They were ostracised by their communities, they were given white feathers. And the two Quaker MPs who drafted the clause lost their seats and it ended their political careers. Now I know that's not going to happen now, but these people had an appalling experience of being pioneers for their cause. And one of the reasons we don't know a lot about this period, the 
the conscientious objectors is that many of them just did not talk about their experiences. That's why I didn't know about my family connection to conscientious objectors. objectors. I wish I'd known, but you can imagine how difficult it is. If it's hard work, work waiting for the bailiffs, imagine if you were refused jobs because you've been a conscientious objector, or you'd been thrown fruit at in the street, or you'd had your hat knocked off, or whatever it happened to be. But these brave pioneers made Britain the very first country to give the legal right to refuse to kill. And that's something we should be very proud of, yeah. and very proud of them. And this legal right has now been extended to most countries. Of course we know that there are around about 16 countries where it's not a, a right. But in most countries, the recognition of conscientious objection to military service is that it is a human right. And this history demonstrates how Britain could once more lead internationally to move the legal right of conscientious objection another step forward. And that's why we're all here today. Changing the world is not an easy one. 35 years ago, Quaker staff, including myself, withheld a percentage of our taxes to pay for the military. The Quaker governing body at that time, meeting for sufferings, took that withheld tax, we tested that case right the way through to the European Council of Human Rights. We weren't successful. We weren't successful then, 35 years ago. How much has changed in that time? What can you think of that's changed in 35 years? A great deal has changed for me in 35 years. And now we're framing this differently. Ruth mentioned today how this bill is about being positive, about being able to divert your taxes towards peaceful means. No one wants to pay for trial. I think, as Ruth Clare said, this is a bill whose time has now 